Graham, you, when you were talking about the development of Northern Australia, uh, you were saying it can't happen uh, without a significantly greater role in the future uh, from the Aboriginal population. Uh, how does what Warren and I have just said resonate with you in that? Well, very sense? much so, and uh, it's certainly very much what I had in mind. It's, um, it, it's something which has to be central to me in the whole process, and it has to be a holistic approach very much along what they suggested. And, uh, you know, pretty much a lot of what we've done in the past has failed. And, uh, and I think, you know, we do, do need to take the, the things which have worked and marry them with the opportunities and the understanding of the land which, uh, uh, which that community has. From a demographic perspective, what uh, was said by both speakers is, was ab absolutely spot on in terms of the aid structure, that um, demographers now talk about a thing called the demographic dividend, which is where you have a population which has a, a, a strong concentration in young productive ages, and countries which can take advantage of that concentration can get a real uh, economic boost. For example, in China, over the last 20 years, 20% 20 of all economic growth in China has purely been due to the demographic dividend, purely been due to that very favourable ratio of young working population to the total population. And to me, as part of the, and, and one of the reasons I was so adamant about a population policy being uh, as much or maybe more about the existing resources in the area as opposed to those that you can bring in um, is that, that you know we, we really do need to probe the demography but the culture uh, and uh, and marry it with with the opportunities and uh, uh, and I think I'd, I'd very strongly endorse the uh, uh, what they said one of the things you said as I left was Gough Whitlam tried all this before not all of it um, <laughs> not everything. Um, I'm sure he'd say that he had, <laughs> but uh, um, the, re the reality is that uh, it hasn't worked, and, and not just what Gough Whitlam did, but what's been tried over, over generations. It's always been part of the Australian rhetoric that we need to get more people out of the cities, and uh, that is just not going to happen. And, and I think that um, the, the, a couple of general principles have to be that the growth can only be where there is a reason for the growth. It is wrong to transfer government or artificially create uh, an economy. The, the fact is you have to build it on something which is, which is uh, sustainable. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and I tried to make that point, that in the past we've always talked about getting people to leave Melbourne or Sydney and going to live in a regional area. The reality is that international migration to me offers an enormous possibility here, which is much more manageable and which it's working all across the world. There, there are more and more migrants going to these types of areas. So, uh, I, I, I Because I, I think, Graeme, you've talked a lot in, in your papers about, about the, the different kinds of, of migration and uh, in, including those who feel they're only being offered um, a place in another country on a temporary basis to fill a short-term need. Yeah. Um, and that uh, and that there would have to be a different kind of plan for the sort of uh, yeah. focus you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I'm, and I don't want to uh, go on too long, but I, I, I really worry about um, a, a plan for the north which is heavily based on temporary coming and going of uh, both international and, in, and internal migration. To me, it has to be based on on families, on established communities which have got social cohesion, which have got um, cultural strength, all of these things. And that, to me, is, is just as important to the growth of the North as the economic job creation. And, uh, um, and, and for, for short-term gaps, it may be useful, but I think we have to take the longer-term view, uh, part of which has to be uh, total inclusion of the, the Indigenous population. Uh, Warren and Nairi, you're, you're both on the Prime Minister's Advisory Council. Um, what sense do you have in the context of what you're both talking about this afternoon, of what we are like, what is al uh, already emerging, or what we are likely to see uh, emerging from the Abbott government? Uh, 
in terms of new initiatives, um, <laughs> new, new ways of tackling old problems? Uh, well, uh, I'll show my assets first, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it is about a more practical and, uh, approach to these things, you know, simple things like if you're going to have an educated workforce, you're going to uh, close, uh, cl look at closing the gap in education. That then the, the basic thing is you've got to have kids at school. But there is a second in, uh, round, an important round of it. Once, what, what is the resources that we need to have in the schools? What are the curriculum that we, we need to have? Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we ensure that we've got the teachers uh, and everything in place for that to happen? And, and, and look, if, the, if they're seriously looking at the development of Northern Australia, we, you know, we have really got, we've got Aboriginal people out there, uh, but it is education is critical to this whole process. But that's, so that's not, why an, over, that's not an overnight on, thing, is it? I sorry? mean, you're talking about a generational Well, not, you're not really, because you, you need to have a two-prone attack. One is, is, the, is the thing of adult education and getting them into jobs very quickly. And that's one of the big things about the Forest Review. That was one of the major focuses of the Forest Review of, of jobs and training and how we move people into that area. Also looking about how do we get uh, small business opportunities, micro enterprises and that operating, getting Indigenous people into those areas. You look at Lirawi uh, tourism in, in Arnhem Land, that projects that are happening now. You, you uh, also need to have then the kids, so you've got a, a flow on, you've got the adults in the back of the workforce working, and you've got, then you've got the kids coming out in the next 10, 12 years. And, uh, and then, so, so it's, it is, a, education is key to it, and that's one of, what, one of the reasons why it's one of the three pillars of the, of the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, education, employment, and community safety. So they're the things that we have to focus on. Uh, you know, Warren showing his assets, I'll just get my nerd on. So, you know, what I'm hoping that we're able to do is put the brakes on this whole ideology over evidence. So, for example, they want to get kids to school. Okay, that's fantastic. I know what the first thing we'll do is we'll have truancy officers. I know that will make you know, everything better. They've jumped in midstream without looking at all of those preconditions, for example, in the first instance, being able to address our data linkage in terms of what we already know and what we do. And what does the evidence tell us? That, in fact, you know, we could have looked at what's currently out there and both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal professionals in education have been working for decades. Excellent papers, significant evidence around how we better engage Aboriginal people in education, get them to value education and get their kids to school, keep them in school and for academic performance to be able to improve over a relatively short period of time. And what does the evidence tell us? So, for example, in health, if we actually apply what we know, say, around renal disease, so if we screen and intervene, so screen, diagnose, intervene early with appropriate management, we can actually halve the mortality from kidney disease within five to eight years. So that's not generational. In fact, mm -hmm. that is incredibly rapid in terms of turnaround. And we could do the same in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities if we just had taken a deep breath and thought, OK, what does the evidence tell us? Let's develop a policy impact assessment. You can get all this stuff done within one to three months and then roll something out that is both you know, action orientated because we have to be seen to be doing something, mm. but also will, will hopefully get us a much better result over the long term and sustain those results that are coming. Yeah, in, 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 in Nari is right. We've got, to, we've got to have a, I'm a great believer in it, uh, looking at uh, in 30 years we had CDEP, I'm not particularly talking about CDEP, but it didn't lift the economic, socioeconomic standing of Indigenous people, get us into the job market. Uh, but in that same 30-year period, China lifted something like 600 to, two, to 800 million people out of abject poverty. That's the type of vision that we, we want to see the, see the, the government, several governments, because in 30 years you're going to have four changes of government. So we want the opposition and the government to be focusing on, uh, on this area of how do we target our resources, target the things that make changes early childhood, looking at the womb, looking at uh, women and so on. So how do we do that? And I, I'm a great believer like Nari that, you know, within, se um, in, within seven years we can resolve a lot of these issues and then build the foundations into the future. Of course, when you're talking about the whole of Northern Australia, you're talking about a lot of remote communities as well. Mm, that's right. And, uh, and um, even if you manage to get uh, a great education 
culture going in those communities, where are the jobs going to be for them when they get through their education unless they leave their communities and go somewhere else? And I suppose we've still got to wait and see uh, what great new job opportunities are going to be created in this vision of Northern Australia and where they're going to be. But nonetheless, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Well, but you, you have to... One of the things I, I notice is that in, in the Indigenous communities, when you look at uh, other townships in rural, remote Australia, non-Indigenous ones, Indigenous communities don't have the same thing. So you, so you don't have, the, you know, you can't have a coffee, you can't have this, you can't... And there's a lot of small business opportunities in these communities. One of the things we're, we're, what we're, on a, we're working with the mining industry about is you're getting Aboriginal people who are in the, working in the mining industry, they're on an eighty to $150,000 a year, get them to spend their money in their community. Because when you spend your money in your community, you're starting to create jobs. And that's what we, we want to focus a lot more on. A lot, lot, of, lot of governments focus on large corporations and big ideas. We just want simple, small ideas that work and get things to happen and, and, and have a simplistic approach. And to me, you know, it can be done very easy. Okay, well, look, we're uh, again slightly over time, but not too bad considering. But um, uh, can I ask you all to, th <laughs> to thank, thank our three panellists uh, for their contribution to the conference. <laughs>